In this video, we'll be covering some of the best feats you can take as a monk. Since monks tend to be more stat-driven than other classes, meaning that it's usually better to just go for ability score increases rather than taking feats. So what we're going to be looking for are feats that not only provide some utility options, but also feats that increase your stats as well. And at number 10, we have Eldred's Adept from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. This is a feat which allows you to learn one Eldritch Invocation from the Warlock class. You must fulfill the prerequisites of any given invocation, so if an invocation requires you to be 5th level, you need to have 5 Warlock levels in order to take the invocation. You can even replace this invocation with another one after leveling up if you're not vibing with the one you're currently rocking. While there are a few decent options you can take, the one we're going to be going over is Devil Sight. This basically gives you a souped up version of Dark Vision granting you the ability to see 120 feet through magical and non-magical darkness. However, there is one major difference between Devil's Sight and Dark Vision that separates them. Devil's Sight only applies to darkness, while Dark Vision applies both dim light and non-magical darkness. This means that a character with Devil's Sight, but no Dark Vision, can see through darkness with no problems, but will still take the usual penalties of any dim light they come across. Meanwhile, Dark Vision just treats normal darkness as dim light, and dim light as bright light. This essentially means that, if you have Devil Sight and Dark Vision, then there is no amount of darkness that can cloud your vision, since you'd perceive normally in all light levels. As for the reason to take Devil Sight specifically, it's because not having to worry about fighting creatures in the dark is very beneficial, since exploring a dark cave can be tough to do when you can't even see what you're fighting in the first place. In general, most marshals can benefit from Devil Sight but monks can make much better use of it. Specifically, the subclass Way of Shadow Monk due to the third level class feature Shadow Arts held down to spend two key points to cast Darkness, Dark Vision, Pass Without Trace, or Silent Spells without requiring material components, along with learning the Minor Illusion Cantrip as an added bonus. Darkness is especially notable, since it allows you to create a sphere of magical darkness that spreads in a 15-foot radius. With Devil's Sight, you would be the only one to be able to see through it which allows you to have advantage on every attack you make inside of it, since creatures would not be able to see you while inside of it. However, outside of Shadow Monk, you wouldn't be able to make active use of Devil Sight unless you went out of your way to take out as many light sources as you can. But the conditions in which it does become useful, such as in a dark cave or dungeon, is what makes Eldred adapt a strong enough pick to be on this list. And that's not even accounting for the other invocations you can take. Eldred's Sight grants you the ability to cast Detect Magic as many times as you want without needing to use spell slots. Eyes of the Runekeeper lets you read all writing. And Beguiling Influence allows you to have proficiency in deception and persuasion skills. Although, for that last one, you might just want to take something like Skilled, so you can be proficient in three skills rather than two specific ones. Still, the added flexibility of Eldred's Adept can't be understated even if you can't take most of them due to all the prerequisites of some of the better invocations. It's just that Devil Sight happens to be strong enough to give this feat a spot on this list, even if it's only at the number 10 spot. And at number 9, we have the Tough Feat from the Player's Handbook. This feat has the very simple yet effective effect of retroactively increasing your maximum number of hit points by 2 per level, up to a maximum of 40 at 20th level. This is one of those general feats that's great for all classes but is especially useful for monks, since, out of every martial class, they tend to be the squishiest due to their hit die being a d8, as opposed to the d10 that fighters and rangers get, or the d12 that barbarians have. While rogues also share the same d8 hit die, they at least have ways to reduce incoming damage, mostly via uncanny dodge, as well as having the option to be ranged attackers by using a bow while still being able to fully benefit from their sneak attack feature. Monks, meanwhile, tend to be very limited in their range options. While Way of the Astral Self is a solid subclass that provides a solid range buff to their unarmed strikes, 10 feet as opposed to 5 feet, you're still going to be within walking distance of most creatures unless you immediately leave after attacking with the arms. While there isn't much to say about tough, being able to survive a few more hits as a monk helps them in line with other martial classes in terms of survivability, which is why tough makes number 9 on this list. It's strong, but it doesn't add anything game-changing how monks are played. It's just nice to have. And at number 8, we have Resilient from the Player's Handbook. This feat allows you to increase any of your ability scores by 1 to a maximum of 20, and then gain proficiency in saving throws using whatever stat you increase. Since monks are already proficient in strength and dexterity saving throws, you're better off increasing any of the remaining stats. In terms of priority, wisdom is usually the best option, since more wisdom means a stronger save DC against stunning strike or other monk features that come with some of the various subclasses. 
It also helps against wisdom saving throws, which become a bit more common at higher level play. After that, constitution is probably second best since it means more hit points for you, which means better survivability. Usually, spellcasters want to take this feat for constitution for better concentration checks, but monks don't really need to, with the exception of Way of the Four Elements monks, which don't really come with a whole lot of concentration spells to begin with. After that, charisma or intelligence can be good to help you round out your stats a little bit more, but by then you'd already be stretching your stat points thinner than you already are. So you may as well focus on the stats you'd need, which brings us all the way back to wisdom. Overall, resilient is an excellent feat for any character. For monks, however, it provides a mix of increasing one of your most used stats, which is the important bit, while also increasing the save DC of some of your monk features and providing a bit more protection against other saving throws you have to make. Stunning Strike is a 5th level feature monks learn and is probably the strongest feature in the entire game, which allows you to spend one key point whenever you hit a creature with a melee weapon attack to attempt to stun the creature until the end of your next turn. While the creature does have to make a constitution saving throw, the worst stat in the game to target, to not be stunned, there isn't a once per turn limit on this feature, meaning that you can just spam Stunning Strike once every attack you make so long as you have the key points to spend. A stunned creature basically loses their entire turn and becomes incapacitated, which automatically drops any spells they might be concentrating on at the time. And because of how spammable Stunning Strike is, it's also a great way of baiting out legendary resistances, since a boss monster that gets unlucky by rolling really low on their constitution saving throw will be forced to use one of their many legendary resistances to turn that failure into a success or lose out on their entire turn. So being able to use the wisdom stat boost for any feat to help your stunning strikes land more easily is a huge boon for monks in general. But the extra proficiency in wisdom saving throws, however, is what makes this feat really worth taking. And that makes it strong enough to take number eight spot on this list. And at number seven, we have the Crusher feat from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. This is a feat that grants you three benefits, including the ability to increase either your strength or constitution score by one to a maximum of 20. You also gain the benefit of displacing creatures once per turn by moving them to an unoccupied space within five feet of it whenever you hit them with an attack that deals bludgeoning damage with the only stipulation that it can't be more than one size larger than you. This benefit is pretty good for forcing creatures to move into unfavorable positions or even off of high ground without forcing any kind of saving throws. It just happens whenever you hit. As for the final benefit of this feat, whenever you score a critical hit with bludgeoning damage, all attack rolls against the creature are now made with advantage until the start of your next turn. Essentially what this feat does is provide your monk with some light utility that can either be used to create space or allows your future attacks on allies to be more accurate if you happen to crit. Crusher also allows you to either push a creature back to let you escape from that creature's range without provoking opportunity attacks, or maybe even move that creature a little bit further into your party, making it harder for them to escape instead. And since Crusher works best with bludgeoning damage, that makes this feat better than its two siblings, Slasher and Piercer, because monks tend to favor unarmed strikes or stabs over other weapons. However, this isn't always the case, so you can always switch out Crusher for either Slasher or Piercer, so long as you use something that's considered a monk weapon you can use, which includes short swords and any simple melee weapons that don't have the two-handed or heavy property, so that you don't lose out on any important damage since a monk's weapons scale with your martial arts die. However, Crusher makes it on this list over Slasher and Piercer because it synergizes more with the monk's kit. Being able to give your allies advantage in all their attack rolls is a fantastic ability to have, even if it only activates on a critical hit. And moving creatures 5 feet whenever you want after hitting them with no saving throw required has a lot of potential for shenanigans. And that's not to mention the fact that you just give yourself more hit points by increasing your constitution, or deal more damage and increase your save DC of your own grapples and shoves by increasing strength. Both of which are excellent choices to put stats into, which is why Crusher takes number 7 on this list. And at number 6, we have the Sentinel feat from the Player's Handbook. This feat, in short, gives you the ability to lock down enemy creatures by allowing your opportunity attacks to reduce the creature's movement speed to zero for the rest of the turn when you hit them. You can also initiate an opportunity attack even if that creature uses the disengage action before leaving your reach. Lastly, you get to make a reaction attack against a creature that decides to target someone other than yourself, assuming they're within your weapon's reach. This is an excellent lockdown tool for any martial class that wants to prevent an enemy from running away. It effectively lets you control the battlefield in a way that can sometimes be hard for your DM to handle at times. For instance, a wavered might try to fly away after attacking a party member, but might be denied due to your monk with sentinel keeping its speed to zero. So now it has to stay on the ground rather than relying on hit and run tactics. And without something like flyby trait, which allows the worm to ignore opportunity attacks outright, including those from sentinel, the Wavern is simply out of luck in this scenario. 
For this reason, Sentinel is considered one of the strongest feats in the game, since it means your DM now has to run encounters around Sentinel more than anything else. However, what makes this feat only take number 6 on this list is the fact that, while it's useful for monks to have, the same can be said for every other martial class that takes it. The only difference is, unless you're going for a full round of burst damage or planning to spam stunning strike, you really don't want to force a creature to focus on attacking you due to your lower hit point threshold compared to the fighter or barbarian. However, this can be solved by only using the reaction attack against a creature targeting something other than yourself, but that sort of defeats the purpose of enhancing your opportunity attacks in the first place. All in all, Sentinel is an excellent feat that shouldn't go unnoticed by any means, but it doesn't have much synergy with monks as a whole and doesn't really do anything that makes you a better monk like some of the other entries that appear on this list. So while good, it's not quite what we're looking for in terms of monk feats, but makes it on this list by virtue of just being so powerful to begin with. And at number 5, we have Fighting Initiate from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. This is a feat which allows you to learn one fighting style option from the fighter class. While there are many solid options to take as a monk, such as blind fighting to give yourself blind sight of 10 feet to detect invisible or obscured creatures in combat, the fighting style we'll be looking over that makes this feat worth being at number 5 on this list is unarmed fighting, which is a fighting style also introduced in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Unarmed fighting does exactly what the name implies. It enhances your unarmed strikes. But it does this by making it so that your unarmed strikes now deal 1d6 plus your strength modifier and bludgeoning damage. However, if you're not wielding any weapons or a shield, then that d6 becomes a d8. And if you have a creature grappled, you can deal 1d4 bludgeon damage to the grappled creature at the start of each of your turns. No rolls or actions necessary. Normally, you'd have to wait until 11th level to make your unarmed strike deal a 1d8 damage. However, with one simple feat, either at first level as a variant human or custom lineage, or at fourth level, your 1d4 unarmed strikes instantly transform into d8s that you can then use your dexterity modifier in place of your strength due to how your martial arts feature works. The only real downside of this feat is that once you reach 11th level, unarmed fighting becomes mostly obsolete, unless you're grappling a lot. However, the lovely thing about Fighting Initiate is that you're allowed to change your selected fighting style to another one whenever you gain a level that grants an ability score improvement. Unfortunately, due to how much unarmed fighting falls off during the second half of a campaign, Fighting Initiate only takes number 5 spot on this list. However, if you know your campaign is only going up to 11th level or lower, then this feat is probably the best feat you could take as a monk in general, since it means your unarmed strikes would technically be at full power right at the early game. And at number 4, we have the Alert feat from the Player's Handbook. This is a feat that grants you the benefits of gaining a flat plus 5 bonus to your initiative. Can't be surprised while you're conscious, it makes it so that other creatures can't gain advantage on attack rolls against you as a result of being unseen by you, essentially making you immune to being ambushed. This is just a great feat in general for anyone that wants to increase their chances of going first in combat, which is usually the main reason for picking this feat in the first place. However, immunity to being surprised and the ability to reject a creature's advantage on their attack rolls from being invisible or otherwise unseen is always a nice bonus with no inherent downsides. However, just like Sentinel, the alert feat doesn't really have any unique synergies with monks, which is why it doesn't take a higher spot on this list. But it does allow you to end fights quicker or gain the upper hand at the beginning of the fight by going first. Run up to the big boss of the room, punch into death, or close to it, which can immediately cause enemies to change their tactics. After all, when it comes to combat in D&D, usually the party that goes first has the highest chance of winning since so they can throw out things like slow or hypnotic pattern to completely skewer the entire combat in one's favor by destroying the enemy's action economy, or even throw in a fireball to deal a good chunk of damage while clearing out any lower level enemies instantly. So, being able to go first as a monk is always a huge advantage for similar reasons as you can probably get an early stunning strike or two against important key enemies. At the end of the day, Alert is a fantastic feat that deserves its spot on this list just due to how strong going first for any character can be in the game. And at number 3, we have Righteous Heritor from Sigil and the Outlands. This is a feat which allows you to increase any of your ability scores by 1 to a maximum of 20, and gain access to the ability Soothe Pain. This is an ability that can be used as a reaction in response to either you or a creature within 30 feet of you taking damage, reducing the damage taken by 1d10 plus your proficiency bonus. And you can use this ability a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus per long rest. This feat adds a bit of protection that you can throw out to a fellow party member that's about to take a big hit, or to give yourself that little bit of extra protection to supplement your lower number of hit points for being a monk. Either way, there's no downside to taking this feat, which is why it ranks so highly on this list. That being said, however, the reason why this feat can't be any higher is due to how you obtain this feat. 
Righteous Heritor is one of those feats where you have to first take a completely different feat before even gaining access to this one. In this case, you not only have to be 4th level, but you also must have taken the Scion of the Outer Planes feat and selected the good Outer Plane part of the feat. As for what this does, Scion of the Outer Planes basically grants you a cantrip and resistance to specific damage type depending on whatever plane you're connected with. Chaotic Outer Plane grants you poison resistance and minor illusion. Evil lets you resist necrotic damage and learn chill touch. Good gives a radiant resistance and teaches you sacred flame. Lawful gives you force resistance and grants you guidance, and the Outlands gives you psychic resistance along with Mage Hand. While the cantrips given may vary in terms of usefulness, the damage resistances are all good, especially force and psychic. Of course, you do need to have the Planescape campaign in order to have access to these feats, and unlike other campaign exclusive feats that follow similar formats, such as Squire of Salomnia, might be a little bit difficult to flavor for a given campaign setting. If your campaign features a lot of Outer Plane shenanigans or something similar in nature, then it might not be so hard to fit into the setting. Otherwise, Scion of the Outer Planes might not be available most of the time to take in the first place, meaning you'd be locked out of Righteous Heritor altogether. However, if your DM does give you the okay to take these feats, then they are definitely worth the two feet investment if you can muster it for that little bit of extra utility. And at number 2, we have Gift of the Chromatic Dragon from Fizzband's Treasury of Dragons. This feat grants you two unique abilities, Chromatic Infusion and Reactive Resistance. Chromatic Infusion allows you to use your bonus action, once per long rest, to touch a simple or martial weapon and infuse with one of the damage types of the Chromatic Dragons themselves, those being Acid, Cold, Fire, Lightning, or Poison. Once you do so, every attack you make with that weapon deals an additional 1d4 of the damage type you chose when activating the ability. This gives you a tiny boost in the amount of damage you deal and will further increase as you make more attacks. However, it's important to keep in mind that unarmed strikes don't count as simple melee weapons, rules as written. So your flurry of blows can't really benefit from the extra damage from chromatic infusion since unarmed strikes don't count as simple or martial weapons. That being said, if you're using a short sword or any other monk weapon of your choosing, both your attacks from your attack action would gain the 1d4 bonus damage. As for reactive resistance, this ability lets you use your reaction upon taking damage from one of the aforementioned damage types and gain resistance to that instance of damage. You can use this a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus per long rest, giving you more chances to use it throughout the day if you really need it. Overall, Reactive Resistance grants you a bit more survivability by allowing you to have the damage of an incoming fireball or a lightning bolt, while also giving you a bit of extra damage via Chromatic Infusion. While there aren't really any special synergies with this feat, it's always good to have extra damage and extra protection on the read for whenever you need it. And if you really want to play into the dragon theme of this feat, Way of the Ascended Dragon is a subclass that allows you to change the damage of your unarmed strikes to the damage type of one of the Chromatic Dragons through the Draconic Disciple feature at 3rd level, as well as the ability to grant you and your allies resistance to one of these damage types as a 10-foot aura at 11th level via the Aspect of the Worm subclass feature, which can grant you resistance to fire damage while you can conserve your reactive resistance for the remaining 4 damage types. Other than that, however, Gift of the Chromatic Dragon is a good enough feat on its own that it takes a high spot on this list. However, it can't go higher, mainly because it doesn't affect your unarmed strikes, rules as written. And for our number one pick, we have the Mobile Feat from the Player's Handbook. This is a feat that grants you a bonus 10 feet to your speed, allowing you to ignore difficult terrain when dashing, and no longer provoking opportunity attacks from creatures that you make melee attacks on, even if you miss, for the rest of that turn. Out of every feat on this list, Mobile sprints miles ahead of the rest of them simply because every benefit just makes you a better monk in every single way. An additional 10 feet of speed stacks with all of the unarmed movement features they get, eventually granting them a whopping plus 40 of movement speed at 18th level. And since most races have an average speed of 30 feet, that's 70 feet of movement per turn without dashing. And if you do decide to dash, that's 140 of movement that ignores difficult terrain. And because Step of the Wind allows you to dash as a bonus action, you can dash twice in a single turn for 210 feet of movement speed. And as an added bonus, if you're Tabaxi, your Feline Agility feature will allow you to essentially blaze through the entire battlefield for 420 feet. And you can stack this even further with haste and possibly some magic items, such as the Boots of Speed. As for the third benefit of mobile, being able to ignore opportunity attacks from creatures you attempt to attack is exceptionally strong with monks, since they can usually make up to four attacks in a single turn with a combination of their extra attack granting a total of two attacks and flurry of blows granting an additional two unarmed strikes in total. And even if you don't use flurry of blows, you can still make at least one more unarmed strike as a bonus action whenever you take the attack action. 
Overall, Mobile is one of those feats that feels like it was made with Monk in mind, and is essentially a must-have if you're the type of player that loves moving around the battlefield uninterrupted, and why it takes number one on this list. This holds especially true once you reach ninth level, where unarmed movement allows you to walk along vertical surfaces with relative ease. So if you ever want a feat that not only increases the speed of your own feet, then you could never go wrong racing towards the mobile feat as soon as possible. Alright, and that's the list. Are there any other feats you enjoy using for monks, or do you have any ideas you'd like to see covered or talked about in future videos? If so, let us know down in the comments below.